Okay, um, thanks a lot. Um, well, welcome um, to the uh, to the next session uh, provided uh, and delivered by AWS. So um, we will talk now about um, Amazon Bracket hybrid jobs, and I say a little, a little bit more about the agenda I have prepared uh, so far. But let me first introduce myself. So my name is Sebastian Stern. I am a senior specialist solutions architect for quantum computing at AWS. Um, I am based in, in Munich, Germany, so it's 7 a.m. for me in the morning, which is quite okay. And um, yeah, I've been with AWS now for almost five years, I would say. I do have an academic background um, with a PhD in, in high energy physics, it's not quantum information science uh, specifically. Um, and I've been doing fundamental research in this field for, for several years. Um, for example, at the LHC at CERN, um, before I transitioned to the tech industry. Um, and um, and then um, I did a stint in a, um, in, in, in a company where I acquired hands-on experience in building solutions on AWS. So I've been an AWS customer at that time. And now I'm working in our global specialist team uh, for quantum in a fairly technical role. Um, at the intersection of, of um, applied science, I would say. Right, so um, what are we doing today? Um, I want to uh, connect this session as good as I can to the session you have um, um, you have um, seen yesterday delivered by my colleague, Prajesh, right? So um, today I want to talk about First of all, Amazon Bracket Hybrid Jobs. This is going to be a technical introduction. It's an introductory session, so I will walk you through, I think, eight slides or so. And then we take a look together at a Hello World example. So I'm going to show you how you can basically run, um, well, your algorithm code, if you have some, as a hybrid job on Bracket. And um, I think that this is an important module because, first of all, um, from the service side of things, this um, is directly addressing the tight integration of classical and, and quantum compute resources we offer on AWS. And uh, second, uh, compared to the standalone, um, let's say the individual or, or atomic quantum tasks, I think you've uh, covered uh, yesterday uh, with Prajesh, we are now leaning into the sort of richer topic of running an entire algorithm on bracket, right? So this is, so the first module we covered today is purely technical, I would say. And then in the second part, we're going to take an, an example, a real life uh, hybrid algorithm. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll talk you through this algorithm, through the algorithm concept, and then we again jump back into the notebook and um, have a look at how this algorithm is then coded up and can be executed as a hybrid job, okay? Cool. So let's get started. Um, first of all, because I'm expecting an audience with, um, uh, with mixed backgrounds, right, uh, in both tech and quantum, so let me start with giving a bit of context first. So hybrid Classical quantum computation is um, is a pattern which well uses quantum and classical computers together to solve a problem or well, execute an algorithm, if you like. And um, typically, we think of al algorithms which switch back and forth between classical and quantum compute steps uh, in that sense. Um, and then they use the quantum computer as a coprocessor, right? Executing just a subroutine of a larger computation. Um, well, this is a well-known approach also in classical compute. Um, but the call out I want to make here for quantum is that um, even in the long run, right? So assume we have access to a large scale fault tolerant quantum computer at some point in time, then we actually don't expect such systems to fully replace our classical computers, right? But rather always act as coprocessors executing um, specific mathematical operations in a larger computation. And also, since we typically will deal with classical data, well, um, we will require, for example, classical pre and post processing. So that means end to end computations 
um, will most likely be hybrid uh, in the long run. Okay. Now, for the near term, um, while we have to deal with rather uh, noisy intermediate scale devices, these hybrid algorithms play an even more special role because the concept of executing only part of the problem on a QPU while offloading the rest to a classical compute environment reduces the problem size on the QPU, right? Meaning you require less qubits and also um, less gates. And this in turn minimizes the impact of noise, right? We have a, um, circuits which are not so deep, not so many logic operations on the circuits. So this is resulting in, in less errors in the computation. So that is the quite powerful concept or that is the, the, the rational behind the, the, the quite powerful concept of hybrid classical quantum algorithms. Then one special case I want to touch on is the class of variational algorithms, right? So, um, and we're going to see one prominent example of such an algorithm later today. In this concept, what we typically use is a parameterized quantum circuit where the parameters take on classical values. I mean, real values. Think of, um, for example, I don't know, the, the angle in a single qubit rotation, for instance, right? So, and in this parameterized circuit, we don't know um, the specific parameters in order to solve a problem a priori. So what we do is we start with an initial guess, um, execute the circuit on a QPU, retrieve the measurement output, and that's a single task execution, right? So what basically you've, you've, you've done with Prashash yesterday. But now um, we take the result of the computation and we feed it into a cost function, a ideally differentiable cost function. So, and that means that's now associated, that single measurement is now associated with some value in the cost landscape um, of, this, uh, of this objective. So then we use a classical optimizer um, to iteratively update these parameters using some gradient estimation uh, strategy uh, to minimize the cost and uh, such find the optimal configuration of the circuit for a very specific problem at hand, all right? So I'm sure that you have now already recognized that this is the same pattern we use, for example, in machine learning. So when we train a neural network right, to, to, to model, again, a very specific problem at hand, and this is indeed uh, exactly the same concept, okay? Great, so now um, we have sort of built our mental model around hybrid uh, classical quantum computation, variational algorithms. So let's now go back to bracket and think about how we actually could execute such algorithms um, once we have them, right? And I wanna also say here, um, uh, our friends at SoftServe, I think will make a much deeper uh, introduction to the topic if they haven't already done so, right? So um, apologies if you hear, uh, uh, if you get information doubled. Um, and uh, but anyways, I'm sure the, uh, the informations are uh, at least aligned. <laughs> so, all right, uh, back to bracket. Now the question is, how can you execute? How can you, well, code up and execute such algorithms from some bracket, right? So first of all, and again, um, we have the bracket SDK. I think you've got an, an introduction to that already, which in fact give us all the low level uh, building blocks we need uh, to code up our variational quantum circuit and right, the quantum part of it. Um, and we could actually use that. And people have done that in the past. Um, create our circuit and then code up the classical part. So the larger, uh, classical um, closed optimization loop, for example, on our own with our own libraries. You can do that, no worries, uh, no problems about that. From an algorithm development perspective, however, it may be convenient at this level to use um, to use libraries which address um, which address um, constructs at a higher level of the stack. So using 
um, application programming libraries. Um, just to give an example, um, which we're going to see later on in action again, is, uh, for example, Penny Lane, right? So this is an open source library for uh, specifically for variational algorithms and for uh, differentiable programming in general. And um, we are actually working very closely with the Penny Lane team, um, making sure that Penny Lane and Bracket best work together. Um, but even in this case, even if it's more efficient from a programming or algorithm development perspective to use such libraries, um, you would in that case still have to do all the heavy lifting for provisioning and managing and maintaining a classical compute environment with task management and so on and so forth. Um, and as such, I mean, yeah, and I mean, you, you would have to do that on your own in order to have a, a system where you where you can run your hybrid experiments in a, in a reproducible manner, let's say. Um, and so our answer to that, so is, or, or what we have then done is, in order to relieve our customers from that burden, is we have released the Amazon Bracket Hybrid Jobs feature. And I would say this turned or evolved into a, a core feature nowadays of Amazon Bracket, providing uh, fully managed capabilities for the execution of hybrid workloads. So let's see how that works. Um, let's take that code snippet here. And um, as usual, um, let me also say that Bracket is built to provide you flexibility, right? How you want to use it, how you want to interact with it. And, and this also um, uh, holds for hybrid jobs. Um, but the by far easiest way, at least in my opinion, uh, to use this feature is with the so-called hybrid jobs decorator, which we have released end of last year, I would say. So let's take a closer look at that. So uh, here's the code snippet, and let's assume um, you have already coded up your algorithm, right, in Python language. Um, you have used, for example, you have built a circuit here. We have a parameterized circuit um, with the circuit constructs in that case um, used from the bracket SDK. But it wouldn't matter if you have if you would have used something like Penny Lane for that. And you can run this algorithm locally, right? So we don't have only only the, the parameterized circuit here, um, but we also have a classical compute loop around that. I mean, this is a very trivial example, of course, but I think you get the idea. And within this loop, we iteratively create new quantum tasks and feed the results of the computation of the quantum computation into some kind of classical routine. Okay, so that's that's the the the, um, the rough picture. Now, all we need to do to run this function, which can be executed locally as a hybrid job in the cloud, is to wrap that function by another Python function and annotate it with this hybrid jobs decorator you get from the bracket SDK. And this will then make your code being executed as a hybrid job in the cloud. So the only thing we need to do in addition to that is add a bit of boilerplate code um, um, in the function scope usually. Um, for example, in that case, instantiating the device um, which you want to use to execute your quantum tasks. Um, of course, you can always hard code things, right? But this is just, I mean, bracket comes with some convenience methods that allow you to pass in, for example, the device identifier from the hybrid jobs uh, from the hybrid shops decorator parameter into the function scope, right? So, I mean, you have to add some boilerplate code to prepare these inputs to your function. But that's basically it, right? So when you then invoke the function, I mean, the wrapper function here, then the SDK under the hood will create a hybrid job automatically. And um, you get as a as a as a as a result or re returned, uh, you get a a job object which you can monitor through its life cycle. And we're going to see later on how the life cycle actually looks like. Now, if you learn, if you want to learn more um, about this feature and also the reasoning um, based on on customer signals um, we have gathered. Um, before we, or when we, when we worked on that feature and released it, 
then I can recommend this uh, release blog post uh, as a great learning resource. All right, so that is in principle the receipt for using hybrid jobs from a developer perspective. But let's now spend a bit more time um, to look behind the scenes uh, and learn actually what, what happens when we invoke this wrapper function. Hey, Sebastian, can well, you I, briefly yes. post the link into the chat so uh, the audience can maybe they can follow that? Um, the link to the chat. Yeah. Let me try to do that. Here we go. That's it. Can you see the drop? No, I did. Oh, hang on. I did send this not to everyone. Uh, you just click the drop down okay. box. The top one is managing group chat, meeting group chat. Oh, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. So you. Yeah, you see, did it work now? Yeah, okay, thank you. Cool. So you're not so familiar with Zoom. <laughs> okay, so um, alrighty. So yeah, let's now have a look right behind the scenes. So what actually happens when we invoke this this wrapper function? So actually, the SDK. So from where you invoke the function, right? So you require to have installed the SDK in order to well that you can use the, the, the decorator itself. So actually the SDK is invoking the yeah, um, create job API of the bracket service. So it actually communicates in, in, uh, in that instant with, with the AWS cloud and sends instructions like, for example, your circuit, like input data um, to, um, to bracket, okay? So then the service starts and provisions one or also more uh, so-called job instances. These are classical compute resources based on your specifications. So um, for example, you can um, select from um, from different instance types, right? With uh, let's say different number of CPUs, GPUs, um, amount of RAM. You can also choose the disk storage and <clears throat> when the job instance is up and running, then the service will start a job container on it. And again, you can choose from either pre-built images or you can actually also create your own Docker image and such, um, get full control over the runtime environment of your job. So as you can already see, the bracket gives flexibility while, while bracket uh, hybrid jobs foresees a certain workflow, it gives you still full flexibility about choosing your compute resources in a runtime environment. Um, the job container comes with the bracket SDK, uh, potentially other toolkits. Again, think of Penny Lane, just for that example. Uh, you can install other libraries on the fly um, also as an alternative if you don't want to provide these already in a Docker file. Um, and it holds your algorithm code, obviously, which is then being executed. And because let's say this algorithm is a hybrid algorithm, right? So you want to run uh, or, or create a series of quantum tasks. Um, you can obviously offload these quantum tasks to one of the QPUs accessible. On bracket. Um, in that case, you even get priority access to the queues, uh, to the device queue, um, such that your tasks, which belongs to the job context, run ahead of standalone tasks, which are potentially queued uh, by other users. And this is actually an important uh, piece because, um, let's say, I mean, in, in, in a hybrid job, usually your tasks are executed in a certain context. They are executed sequentially, iteratively, uh, over a, a, a specific period of time. But because these devices currently have imperfections, um, they also have something like device drift, right? So 
you want within a hybrid job where the tasks um, belong to the same, well, to the same algorithm, you actually want to execute them as close as possible together in time, right? Such that you have, um, such that you can minimize the dependency on the device group, for example. So therefore this uh, priority access uh, has indeed um, uh, has indeed a meaning for the performance of the algorithm later on. I mean, not just the runtime performance, but also the quality of the results. What else? Obviously, you can also choose to run on an on-demand simulator, right? So yesterday, I think you've uh, you've received already an introduction into the different QPUs and on-demand simulators we offer on Bracket. And what's also um, interesting is um, you can use a simulator which is embedded onto your job into your job container. And um, this is particularly beneficial if you don't um, need, let's say, a high performance simulator, if you don't um, need to simulate 30 qubits uh, with state vector simulation, let's say. But you have smaller circuits or smaller qubit numbers to simulate. Um, but at the same time, if you have many, many, many tasks you, you want to create in a short period of time, then uh, an embedded simulator may have better performance characteristics because you don't have the latency to offload the, um, the tasks um, onto, a, onto a bracket backend. And we will also see an example of that later on. Um, what else uh, we have within hybrid jobs? Well, Bracket tightly integrates with several other AWS services. And I just want to give uh, 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 where, some very few examples. Um, Amazon S3, right? So the AWS managed object storage service is used um, to securely and durably store both your input data and the algorithm code, as well as the job results, but also the individual task results. So you're going to find them later on in, in S3. Then we have a good integration with CloudWatch. Uh, the service is used to give you live um, monitoring capabilities and you know access to logs and metrics of your job, such that you know what's going on while the job is running. And then finally, uh, just because I mentioned this early on, um, when you, I mean, that you have the opportunity to bring your own container, right? So um, here we have this integration with Amazon ECR, the Elastic Container Registry, that lets you upload and make available uh, a private image um, for your very own job around time. Um, and <clears throat> this is very interesting also in con conjunction with the embedded simulator feature, because what you can do is you can even bring your own simulator, right? If you package it in a Docker file. That's a quite cool feature, actually. Okay, um, finally, uh, of course, uh, after the job is completed, then, well, the service tears down the environment and releases the compute resources such that you don't have to manage or take care of idling capacity. So let's wrap up. <clears throat> um, why is this now? Why is this cool? I mean, first of all, hybrid job jobs gives you convenience. Um, so with this fire and forget um, user experience for submitting algorithms, for running algorithms, I've just talked you through. Uh, although you're offloading your job to to the cloud, which runs then asynchronously, you may you maintain full control and 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 insights uh, through the through the live monitoring capabilities of metrics you define yourself. So these are not predefined me metrics, but these are metrics you can define yourself. And then finally, hybrid jobs is built for performance, right? So priority access to GPUs, I covered. I covered. What we also have is a performance compilation strategy for parameterized circuits, um, and also the ability to choose your classical compute specifications, um, right? So allowing you to pick the best um, environment based on your specific requirements. Excellent. So now we have everything we need to delve into um, the Jupyter Notebook, the AWS accounts, and um, and execute that. Let me just. One last slide. Let me just um, recap and 
basically complete um, the specific bracket terminology, um, you know, of shots and tasks and hybrid jobs, because um, um, this, well, if you are used to other um, quantum programming frameworks, for example, uh, platforms, then they may use different terms for the same thing. So I think it's good to sort of align ourselves and what are the, the, the special terms in bracket. So I think you you have a good understanding already what is a shot, right? So this is really just a single execution of a quantum circuit together with the measurement instruction. So really the single set of instructions you execute on a, on a device. Right? But then <clears throat> um, I think you also already know the concept of a task, right? So Brajesh, I think, has walked you through that uh, already uh, yesterday. So this is really the, the atomic request we submit when we want to perform a quantum computation, right? So that contains the circuit definition um, <clears throat> that there you specify your number of shots you, you want to execute on, on a specific device, right? And now with hybrid jobs, we have an, an additional um, instance, and this is called a job, right? So, um, and this is basically the construct which wraps both the classical and quantum compute instructions, um, <clears throat> including a series of, of typically iteratively executed quantum tasks, right? So, and the reason why I um, um, why I mentioned this specifically is that. So, for example, I think when you are used to Qiskit, which is a very famous programming uh, library for quantum, then uh, what we call a task is called a job in Qiskit. So, therefore, you know, I mean, uh, I thought it might be helpful to uh, <clears throat> to have all these three um, terms on, on one slide um, to recap a little bit. All right. So that's about it. I would now um, I, I will now have to switch um, windows I share. And um, before I do that, I want to pause um, and uh, check if there are some questions I, I need to answer. Let me check the chat. Chat looks quiet so far. All right. So I think we're doing good, right? So let me... Mm. All right, the control panel. Here it is. I now share a new browser window. So how does it look like? Do I have to zoom in a little bit or does it work nicely for you? Just uh, check because I think most of the participants have attended the session yesterday morning with Brad Jesh, so they should be familiar with uh, uh, the workshop studio. But just in case, yeah, if anyone had uh, have issue to log into the workshop studio, you or you haven't attended yesterday morning session, please let us know. Um. Right. So um, thanks for for mentioning that, Albert. So so I'm going to paste now two, two links into the chat. And this is just for those who are currently not logged in already to their workshop environment, right? So if you want to start with Workshop Studio, if you want to get access to these temporary AWS um, accounts we, we require, uh, we provide uh, for the next one and a half days or so. Then yeah, exactly. So this is the link to log in, and <clears throat> um, I think you should also be able. I mean, even if you're not logged in, I believe you should be able to access this page here, which actually walks you through the steps to first sign into Workshop Studio. Right. So if you go to that page, you click to onto the first link, sign into AWS Workshop Studio. Then there is a step by step. Uh, walk through with a lot of screenshots um, that explains how you actually get access to this workshop environment. And then uh, there's another link access to Amazon Bracket. So once you are logged in into Workshop Studio, then um, this explains how you get access to the AWS Management Console. And I will have to do these steps anyways now, so you can watch me um, doing that steps as well. 
Um, let me also mention one thing. I mean, uh, or or maybe well, let me mention that once again. Um, on this workshop studio landing page, when you click on Amazon Bracket General Immersion Day modules, so here you see a selection of modules we typically, um, or I mean, yeah, we typically cover when we are running um, workshops. And so I think yesterday you have been running quantum circuits and simulate on simulators and QPUs. The module, the two modules we will cover today is run algorithms with hybrid jobs. And then later on, we're going to run a uh, max cut with QIOA. And um, you can download the, the SIPT example notebooks uh, by clicking on these links um, such that you have it for later on for your personal studies. But uh, for, um, uh, for this event here, uh, this code is already copied in your, in your notebooks. Okay, cool. So that's about it. Um, I now enter the AWS console for my temporary account here. This takes a bit of time. Here is the management console. Let me zoom in a little bit. General AWS management console. We're going to go to bracket. Um, <clears throat> so I have here these, uh, my favorite um, service items here at this, uh, here at the, at the navigation bar, but we can also just type in bracket and, uh, and click on it. Um, if you click here on this little star, then you make it such an, such a, a favorite icon here for easy access. All right, so now here in the management console, you already know this. Um, let's dive immediately into um, the uh, the topic of this uh, of this hands-on lab. So let's open our notebook instance. Uh, this takes a bit of time as I'm doing this for the first time. Should have done this before, actually. All right, so here's our Jupyter Lab environment. I also zoom in a little bit. So how does this look um, for you? I mean, is it, is the is the font big enough? Should I zoom in a little bit more? It's looking good on my side. All right, cool. So then, um, again, just a recap. So every bracket notebook instance comes with um, these two directories already uh, provisioned. And in, in, in particular, in the bracket examples directory, you find a lot of example notebooks for specific bracket features. Um, and also starting from Hello World 101 examples to more complex uh, reference implementations for, for real life algorithms. So that's a great uh, resource uh, to look into and um, later on, when I wrap up the session, I will also give you um, uh, a link where you can access these examples on GitHub. So for the um, for these workshop environments we are providing here, we have an additional directory called Bracket Workshops, and we're going to go into that. We go, go into Immersion Days. And in Immersion Days, we go into Hybrid Jobs, right? So that's basically the path uh, or that's deeply nested directory structure. <laughs> okay, so this is basically the path where we go. And here you will find two pictures, uh, two PNGs and one notebook. So let's open the notebook. And what I'm gonna do is I just um, close here the file browser so that um, <clears throat> you can see the notebook a bit better, hopefully. So yeah, so this is about a technical introduction, what you need to do to run uh, uh, a bracket hybrid job and learn how uh, and learn basically the look and feel of bracket hybrid jobs. So, of course, we need some kind of an algorithm, right? And uh, <laughs> we really came up with a very, very, very trivial toy problem. Um, so, any of you um, with uh, with a background in um, quantum physics or linear algebra will find this uh, embarrassingly trivial. But um, still, you know, just for the sake of have something to run, um, let's assume that our problem we want to solve 
is how actually the expectation value of the set observable um, changes with the angle of an Rx single qubit rotation gate. Okay, so let's assume we have the circuit diagram here, right? One qubit um, initialized in the cat zero state, we apply an Rx gate, um, which takes on a real classical parameter, theta, and then we measure the expectation value in the set basis. So, I mean, obviously, this can also be calculated analytically, right? So we wouldn't have to code up a hybrid algorithm to, uh, to solve that problem, right? And the analytic, as I said, the, the analytic answer to this problem is that, well, the expectation value actually goes with uh, cosine theta, okay? Fair enough, but let's assume we wouldn't know that, and we actually want to want to evaluate that with a hybrid algorithm. So the way how I would code up this challenge is the following. I would create myself a function, add some parameter, add some uh, hyperparameter, some parameters which I can use basically as hyperparameters to my algorithm. So things like the number of iterations, the number of shots on the device, the device itself. So then I would first code up the quantum circuit. You have seen the quantum circuit diagram already above. So here again, this is the equivalent circuit to this. Um, we are using an Rx gate on qubit with index zero. And uh, we don't know the, um, the angle, we don't fix the angle up front. So we add here this free parameter called theta. Um, as an as an as an angle um, to the gate, and then finally we um, calculate the expectation value for the observable set on this uh, qubit with index zero. So that's the quantum circuit, and then <clears throat> I would just scan over a selection of angles. This is how I would do it, and um, the way I coded this up is I just take um, the number of iterations. And uh, um, and um, and uh, calculate my my test angle per iteration based on this uh, iteration index and the step size. Um, I I hand in as a hyperparameter, but again, this is really just just an example to to have it to have it flexible, right? I mean, you could also just pass in a selection of angles you want to test or something like that. Never mind. Anyways, what we need to do is then for each angle we want to test, we have to uh, process the circuit on the device, uh, get back the results, and then we have the expectation value for that specific angle. Um, here I just log uh, both the, the rotation angle and the expectation value to the console. And then finally, what I do is I store uh, this um, uh, this data structure consisting of a well, it's a dictionary of a, containing the rotation angle and the expectation value. Um, I just sort this to a, to a to a list, right, and return the results. So this is how I would code this up. Rather straightforward, I think. So and then, of course, I can execute this function locally. No problems. All I need to do is provide all the inputs to my um, uh, to my function signature. So, for example, if I pick to run on the um, on-demand state vector simulator uh, of bracket, uh, then I can execute this function here. Um, I choose to run six iterations, um, 100 shots per task. So the function is running locally. The individual quantum tasks are offloaded to the cloud, obviously, are offloaded to, to bracket. And as you can see here, yeah, we are already done. Um, I could print the results and see that indeed here I have the state of structure that for every iteration, um, I get the uh, corresponding angle for my single qubit rotation and the expectation value. All right, so this is my uh, solution <laughs> to the problem. Okay, so now we actually want to look at how we can run this as a hybrid job. And in principle, there are two ways. I mean, two ways which I would just want to recap how to run here a hybrid job. The first one is um, 
to offload the quantum tasks to an actual bracket device. You're depicted on the left-hand side where the actual bracket device or bracket backend is either an on-demand simulator or a QPU, or what you can also do is run on an embedded simulator. I will, for this example here, will choose the left-hand side approach. And then for the next examples so of the QRA algorithm, we're going to look into the right example. OK, so how to create a job? Um, we need a couple of libraries or, or modules from the bracket SDK. And then again, all you need to do is create a wrapper function. We call this now hello world. This wrapper function can take um, also some parameters. Um, again, which you can later on conveniently specify hyperparameters with. Um, and then you need to annotate this function with this hybrid job decorator. We want to run on the SV1 simulator. And then here, here we actually execute the same function as we executed locally above. Right? So all we need to do before is just um, well provide the inputs, right? And some of the inputs are already given indirectly via the hyperparameters um, um, as hyperparameters, and others need some kind of pre-processing, like for example, instantiating a device. Um, and then um, in the return statement here, we return a dictionary and these return, or, or this data structure is then stored as a chop result, okay? So this is an important point. So we're gonna do execute the algorithm we have, and then save the job results. And this we do by putting this into the return um, uh, const, uh, in, into the return instruction of the uh, of our wrapper function. So, and then we can just invoke this function. And what you get is actually a hybrid job instance. Yeah. So here's the job object. Uh, we're going to print the job arn, and we're going to print the job state. So here, this is the job ARN. ARN stands for Amazon Resource Name. So that's the unique identifier of this specific job instance or job option. Um, and this has, you know, currently a state queued. Um, the job is now created on bracket and it will follow a certain life cycle, similarly to the individual quantum tasks. So if we check the job state again, it's now in the running state. Okay, so now that we have created the job, when we go back to the, um, uh, to the management console, then we see here under hybrid jobs, the job we have just created. So a few things I want to, um, a few information I want to share here. First, we see the job name. And the job name here is Hello World, followed by, that looks like a, a Unix timestamp. And it actually is a Unix timestamp. It's a Unix timestamp, Unix timestamp of when you have created uh, the job via the jobs API. So where does this name come from? I go back to my code, and you will see that the wrapper function is called hello world. So the standard or default behavior of, of hybrid jobs is that uh, it takes the function name, the name of your wrapper function, and adds the, the Unix timestamp as a suffix. Okay, uh, But you can also overwrite that. So you could add uh, a parameter um, job name in the hybrid jobs uh, decorator signature. So that's number one. You see it's in the running state. And then here you also see the device at which uh, um, um, the, the quantum tasks are executed. So let's click on this job. Here find more details about it. Um, event times, so when the job is created, when the job has started running. Um, you find some details, for example, about, um, again, the device uh, you're running on, but also here, further down below, um, the um, configurations or the specifications of the instance. Um, this is the classical, the jobs instance the job is running on. 
You can specify that again in the signature of the hybrid job decorator. I just used um, the fault um, uh, specifications now, and this is going to be an MLM5 launch instance. And by the way, um, maybe Albert can, uh, in the background, share a, a link with you on the chat uh, with these different instance types uh, we have available. All right, so what else we've got? Um, here you see the container image. Right, so again, we are using the default settings and that is just the Amazon bracket base uh, container image. But again, you could provide your own image as well. And further down, you see some hyperparameters, the hyperparameters we have specified. Excellent. So you can also refresh. Ah, okay. <laughs> um, I'm always talking too long um, when I introduce this here. Um, the job is already completed. So, um, but anyway, anyways, let's let's uh, finish this uh, this off. So, in the monitoring uh, monitor section here um, of the jobs page, you see the two metrics I have exposed. How did I expose these two metrics? Go back to the job. Uh, in the job script, in the job function, I have used here this log metric helper functions. And these log metric helper functions are actually functions from the bracket SDK. And what they do is they log these metrics in a specific format to the console, right? As you can see here. So, and um, what then hybrid sorry what then hybrid jobs does is take this specific or parse the specific format and create uh, the metrics out of that so every every float you uh you log with a hybrid job with this um, log metric helper function will be displayed here um for convenience and then finally, what we also have here is the individual quantum tasks we have created during the job, right? And these are, I think, 11. Yeah, exactly. These are 11 Just because we create one task per iteration. Okay, great. Um, one last piece of information. When you click here on view in CloudWatch logs, then you get access to the console logs of your hybrid job. So when you click on that, it opens up a new tab. Um, then you will see here a selection of log streams. Um, here you actually just have one log stream you can choose. Um, it's prefixed again with the job name. So click on the log stream and here you see exactly the same console logs as we have seen when we were executing this function locally, right? So as expected. Cool. Um, so very technical, I know. Um, so but these are kind of all the information I wanted to share with you, how it actually looks and feels when you interact with hybrid jobs. So I would now go back to um, the notebook. And so let's now again put up the head of a algorithm developer. Um, and continue with our flow so we can check the job state again obviously it's or it's it's completed now as we have seen in the console so the next thing we do is we're going to load the results and we can load how you load the results is, is by using the job.result function if your job is not completed yet then this function executes synchronously or I mean, it always executes synchronously so it will wait until so it would block and it will wait until the job is done, right? So um, it's a good practice to check the job state before calling the job.result function. Um, well, obviously there are the actual job results um, in uh, a, well, well, so I mean the, the exact data structure we have returned from the, um, we have returned in our wrapper function. Um, so that's basically the information we wanted to store. They are in the result object, but you also have some access to some metadata, for example, the billable duration of your of your job instance, right? So 100, 107 seconds, for example. Good. You could also look into the logs here programmatically, not having to click through the console. And yeah, what you also have 
uh, in our case is we have uh, used the task tracker of the SDK to summarize how many quant what were the quantum resources we actually actually consumed. Okay, so we were using eleven thousand shots, uh, distribute over eleven tasks because we were specifying one thousand shots per task, and also get the um, aggregated execution duration of all our quantum simulators. Um, right. Yeah, so we were charged uh, four US dollar cents for that simulation. Excellent. Um, so now let's uh, go ahead and verify. Let's do post processing, right? Classical post processing, verify our results of our, the results of our algorithm. Okay, great. Uh, we are lucky. So um, the measurement results of our scan through the rotation angles uh, are these red, uh, are these red bullets here. And they indeed follow the the well the analytic result the co cosine theta of the rotation co cosine of the rotation angle. Um, so yeah, um, great. So um, seems like uh, the uh, the information I gave you above. All right, that's uh, so I'm lucky. Um, so yeah, that's basically the outcome of our um, of our result. So we can basically wrap this up and write a paper. Awesome. Um, one word also on running on QPUs. Um, I think the Regetti device is not online at the moment, but maybe OQC is. Let's see. Yeah. Um, so the devices also come with um, 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 so they give you visibility into their queues, right? So you can get queue depth information uh, before you submit something onto a device, right? So for example, you can see here that this device has twenty eight tasks in the normal queue and zero device uh, zero tasks in the priority queue. So if you would create a job on that device, then your tasks would end up here in the priority queue. So this is how you can basically check. If you have a job object at hand, then you can also call the queue position. But since our job is already completed now, so we don't get this information. Final piece of advice, when you are in the process of coding up your hybrid algorithm, then, and as I said, I mean, the, the, the purpose of this wrapper function is to provide all the inputs to your actual algorithm function, and also to um, to store uh, or consolidate all the all the output all, all the results basically in data structure and save it for later. So you may want to want to debug that or right do some fast prototyping, and it can be a bit uh, it can be a bit daunting to do that. I mean to 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 create a job in the cloud every time. I just do like one iteration maybe and just verify that, that everything is coded up correctly. For that purpose, it makes sense to add to this hybrid job decorator um, the parameter local equals true. And what that will do um, when you execute this function, then it will download the, um, the Docker image, start a Docker container locally. So what you need to have is Docker installed, obviously. And then it runs the... Um, so the, the 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 routine that would normally be executed on a job instance would be executed here or is executed here in this notebook. So this is a quite uh, quite convenient feature. Okay, let's just wait until the job starts to run the local job, and then we do a quick sanity check in the console, and then I I'm done with this first module. So that took about 50 minutes. I think I'm doing quite good on time. So here we go. Image is downloaded, container started, and now here we are executing our um, algorithm locally. This does not count for the quantum task. The quantum tasks will be run wherever your device or I mean, based on the device you have selected. So in that case, the, the quantum tasks are executed on SV1, but just 
the um, uh, the classical uh, bit of the algorithm is executed locally, right? So but obviously you can also specify here a local simulator and then also the quantum task will be executed here. Good, so that's now executed here. And as you can see in the console and the hybrid jobs, there is no second hybrid job because we are executing that locally in the notebook, okay?